In the previous episode, we were talking about the fall. And I think one of the reasons that pain may shake our faith or create an undue negative reaction or just destabilize us in some way is because many of us have never quite come to terms with the fall. We still feel that in spite of the Bible's clear warnings that a fall has happened, that this world nevertheless is going to be a paradise for us or should be a paradise for us. But if we just accepted what the Bible is telling us about the nature of this world and if we just adjusted our attitude accordingly to that, we could be a lot more stable and content and even happy here in spite of everything that's going on around us. Let me explain. Imagine a building with 100 rooms in it and in each of these rooms there are only the most basic of amenities. Very, very basic. The walls are bare, there's nothing on them. There's only one small window in each room. It's got a small twin bed and it's got very thin pillows and duvet and the shower only provides 10 minutes of hot running water each day. Very, very basic amenities. Now, imagine an experiment where 100 people are asked to live in this building for a weekend, one person per room. But here's the difference. 50 of the candidates, half of the candidates are told beforehand that they're entering into a five-star hotel, while the other 50 are told that they're entering into a prison. Afterwards, they're all going to be asked how they liked their experience over the weekend. Now, what's gonna happen here? Well, the 50 who thought they were going into a five-star hotel are obviously going to be furious with their experience over the weekend. They're gonna say it was dark, it was cold, it was uncomfortable, the bed was small, and having just 10 minutes of hot running water a day was simply intolerable. However, the 50 candidates who thought they were going into a prison, well, they're probably gonna have quite a different view of their experience. They're probably going to think that it wasn't too bad, all things considered. It had a window to let in some light. Some prisons don't have that. It had a bed, it had a pillow, it had a duvet, it had a shower that offered hot running water each day. They probably didn't anticipate some of those luxuries. So it's a curious situation at the end of the day that both sets of candidates have experienced the exact same building, But whereas one group have ended up really furious and outraged with their experience over the weekend, the other group have ended up really quite happy with their experience. And it all depends on the kind of place they thought they were living in. It all depends on the kind of place that they thought they were being given here. That determines their attitude to the whole weekend and their ultimate feelings of satisfaction. Now the same concept applies for this whole world. How we feel about it depends largely upon the kind of world we think that it is. If we approach this world with the idea that this is God's best attempt at a five-star hotel, then we're quickly going to end up disillusioned, angry and shaken when pain inevitably comes along. We're going to want to complain to the manager and we're going to lose our faith in him. However, If we approach it in the way that God wants us to, understanding that it's a fallen and corrupted place, we can really make the most of this situation. It's not a prison, that was just an extreme example to make a point, but it's no paradise either, and God's been very clear about that. And if we just accept what God is telling us about that, again, we can make the most of this life. We can make it an adventure. We can maybe even enjoy it and have some fun here. We can, as Paul described it, learn the secret of contentment in every circumstance. Living with the right attitude to this life is really going to make all the difference to what you make of your time here. There's a passage in the New Testament where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's explaining the tribulation that lies ahead for them in life. And he doesn't hold back either. He's very honest about the pain and suffering that's coming up for them in the future. He says the world will hate them, that they will be persecuted, and he even tells them that some of them are going to be killed for his name in the future. Now, why does Jesus tell them about this upcoming pain ahead of time? Well, it's so that they might have the right attitude when that pain arrives. He says, I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith, for you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service to God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I am telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. Jesus told his disciples of the kind of life he was calling them to in advance so that when they encountered the pain and the suffering, they wouldn't be puzzled by it or thrown off course by it. He didn't want them to lose heart, you see. And if he didn't make it plain beforehand that pain and suffering would be part of their experience in this world, then that could have happened. They could have abandoned the faith, finding the whole thing simply intolerable and becoming miserable and angry with God. It's having a realistic foreknowledge of what's ahead 
that meant they were able to adopt the right attitude towards life. They can now say whenever they met with suffering, well, of course, this is happening. Jesus told us this would happen. We didn't expect anything less from this world. Now, it appears that even though Jesus had told his believers not to expect a cakewalk, and he'd been very clear about the trials that lay ahead, that many of them nevertheless did still expect a cakewalk, and they still expected a life of ease. Therefore, when trials and suffering came along, they began to wobble in their faith. So Peter wrote to them saying, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening. So Peter's message is, why would you wobble in your faith over this, of all things, over pain, as though something strange were happening to you? This is exactly the kind of life that Jesus said lay ahead. Back in the introduction to this series, I quoted a message I received that read, Mark, I have followed the fuel project for years and I need some help. After my brother died, I stopped believing in God. I want to, but I can't. Now, I can totally empathize with that pain. I've lost family members too. I lost a cousin to cancer quite recently. But, and I don't want this to sound too abrupt, but why are trials and sorrow shaking our faith like this? as though something strange were happening, when this is exactly the kind of thing that God said was going to happen in this world. Indeed, Jesus said very explicitly, here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. This is what I mean about struggling to adapt to the fall. There's still a part of us that, despite knowing about the fall theoretically, still expects and demands that this world is going to be a paradise for us. We read these passages about trials and sorrows, and we kind of respond by saying, yeah, 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 yeah. But that would happen to me, right, God? You know, come on, it's me. I'll have endless health and wealth and comfort on this earth, right? And nobody that I know is ever going to get sick or die. I mean, right, Lord? And it's as though God has to keep pulling us back to his word and saying, look, read this again. You will have many trials and sorrows in this world. Stop expecting it to be a five-star hotel because it's not. And you're setting yourself up for misery if you think that way. I'm being honest with you here and being upfront, trying to adjust your attitude so that you won't be surprised or shaken or abandon the faith when this kind of stuff inevitably happens. There are some Christian preachers that confuse things and muddy the waters here, and that can be a problem. Some TV evangelists tell people that God does promise a five-star hotel in this world. They say that God promises a luxury experience here with endless wealth and health and a complete absence of pain. That is their message, and it's contradictory to the Bible. Of course, it tickles a lot of ears. It's what people want to hear, so it makes them popular and it makes them lots of money. But all they're really doing is setting people up for disillusionment in the long Long run. We must listen and come to terms with what God is telling us about the fallenness of the world. It's imperfect, it's corrupt, it's not going to go the way that we always want it to, and when all that stuff begins to hit, we shouldn't be thrown off by it. I feel like the faith wobble in this message is really actually down to two things. Firstly, not coming to terms with the fall, expecting a paradise, a five-star hotel, and then being shaken when things begin to go wrong. And I think that can be fixed quite easily by getting a biblical view on what this world is really actually all about. And if we can have that biblical view, we can learn contentment in every circumstance. And that's why God has been so keen to tell us about the fall and to give us a realistic view of this world. But secondly, it seems that this faith wobble is also partly about not coming to terms with eternal life, either. And I think that's a really common thing. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. So the brother isn't really dead. He's merely gone on ahead to a better place and he'll be seen again one day. This is why the Bible says we don't grieve as people who have no hope. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, this place is promised to be brilliant, by the way. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. There will be no more pain, suffering, or death in that place. It says, God will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. That promise is repeated again in Isaiah. It says, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. Now, if we really believed all that, then clearly it should make a massive difference to our attitude to this life. It seems to me we keep thinking the five-star hotel should be here. No matter what the Bible says, it should be here. 
And so we're devastated when it turns out that it's not, and we grieve as people who have no hope when people die, as I think is going on in this letter. But God is speaking to us through the Bible, saying the Five Star Hotel isn't here. It's up ahead, and it's that shift of focus that now makes all the difference. If you put the Five Star Hotel here, then there's misery in this life, and there's devastation and death. But if you put the Five Star Hotel up ahead, where God puts it, and where it should be, then there's a certain contentment and stability in this life, whatever the circumstances, and there's a kind of celebration now in death. In fact, Paul said that to live is Christ, but dying is now gain. He said, I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. So I just wanted to say that a lot of the problems that we have with pain and the reason it shakes our faith and destabilizes us so much are solved almost instantly if we just listen to what the Bible is saying and put our faith in what the Bible is actually saying about this stuff, especially about the fall and eternal life. I'm not sure I've really nailed this video. I feel like I haven't explained this well enough. I've maybe been a bit waffly. But nevertheless, we have to crack on and get on to the next one. So I hope this one made sense. And uh, nevertheless, we just have to get on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs>